Yes. <laughs> um, you're welcome. Thank you. So I normally just start with um, introduce yourself. Let's get to know your name, what you do, where you're from, and where you are right now. Um, my name is Emma Edosio Dalin. I am a filmmaker based in Lagos, Nigeria, and I am in Belgium at the moment. Okay. Um, so I'm going back to, I, I know you, um, we're definitely, it's not like we're like friends like that, but we, we met at a particular, I think a very important time. Um, when I met you, you're just this woman, uh, with a focus because I, I remember our conversations. The conversations I would watch you have with people would definitely be about what they wanted to have with you, which was about um, making videos for, for music. But whenever you came close to me, we'll just dive into how you want to be a filmmaker, your dream, your, your projections and all. And I enjoyed the fact, I personally enjoyed the fact that I was getting to have those film conversations with you instead of having um, music video conversation. So my mm -hmm. first concept for you would be, um, what triggered filmmaking for you as a young woman? What triggered filmmaking? Um, I think in the beginning, I, I had no clue. I stumbled into filmmaking because I wanted to study, I was, I studied computer science and I, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life and I stumbled into it. But in later on, I that one of the things that triggered or pushed me into filmmaking is the fact that is the fact that growing up, I really didn't get the chance to express myself. Um, I grew up in a family where um, one boy, six girls, and my mom's greatest fear was for her girls getting pregnant, and we're very shielded. So I didn't even know anything about life until after university, because even in university, my mom is, will come to the university to stay with us, to talk to my oh, lecturers, wow. to, yeah, it was, it was that, I grew up in a very strict household. Um, and I was always different um, in the sense that I would walk on the street and I would observe, and I was quite popular, even without talking to people, because I was very curious. And everybody would ask my mom about me and my mom was very worried that look out of all my daughters why is it that it's only you that everybody's asking about and in so many ways i had to lock myself inside and hide who who i i truly was at that time so i think one of the things that attracted me to filmmaking was to to talk about my life to talk about my experiences it, it's an opportunity to share my world share what I see with, with my audience. And I think that's the reason. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's amazing that you stumbled at it because meeting mm. you, you were very clear. So, so the, you know, perceptions are, might be wrong or right. Um, mm. but observing you, um, the young filmmaker, then it, it really was a mere to learn. You know, I'm here to, to collect the knowledge I need, but I'm not going to be here for long. You, you were really clear about that when we had conversation. And also, you were really clear about, I'm not going to let anybody fuck with me. So where did that boldness come from? Where did that clarity come from? Um, I think the boldness came from the fact that I was in an industry surrounded by men, mainly dominated by men. And in order to survive there, you, I had to prove that I was 10 times better than my contemporaries. And I had to, I felt like I always had to prove a point. Um, um, it, it's a very, it, it's a very, especially filmmaking in Nigeria is very, it, it can tear you into pieces in the sense that there's, there's no kind of structure. And back then there was no kind of structure and you sort of had to find your way. And for me, it was a struggle where I had to find my own way. And I had, 
and I knew that I had a short time to do that. And I knew that in order to prove myself and to have people trust me, I had to be 10 times better and constantly show people that, hey, I can do this. Forget my tiny frame, forget everything. So it was, I think that drive to, to let people know that, okay, I, I can handle these responsibilities. I can do this work. That was what constantly pushed me to want to be better, to want to be, to be like Clarence, to want to be like the, the people that were already making stuff back then. Yeah, that's, that's, that's nice. Do you think, do you think that you have, um, so for, this is hypothetical. Do you think that now mm. you, you were able to get that respect? Or do you think that people still feel um, the way they feel when, when you were trying to make your point? Um, I think it also, that question also boils down to the society. Yeah. As the young child, they always be looked at as the, you know, as, oh, Emma, you know, tiny Emma that used to work with us back then. There's always that sense of, um, there's always that sense of, oh, this is my baby girl director. This is my baby and but I think that gradually I found new audiences that have helped me sort of like grow from that point in my life and I, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. if I make any yeah. sense yeah yeah um you you tend to grow out of those relationships into new yeah. um relationships that value yeah. you and value your worth and I'm not saying that these people don't value you no, there's no. always that you know, there's always that, oh, this is my baby. Oh, Emma, I know Emma, she's this. But, but you know, I've grown into relationships where people have come to trust me, trust my competence and um, give me more responsibilities than before. Yes. Yeah. I, I hope, I hope, and this, this, is, this is a selfish question. I hope, mm. um, yeah, I hope I was not in, I hope I made you <laughs> feel, no, 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 it's, it's serious. It's serious because I was very conscious of, <laughs> I was very conscious of this back then. Mm. I hope I no, made no. you feel safe. No, I think you did. You definitely did made me feel safe. You definitely, conversations with you were not about, oh, okay, um, oh, this young lost girl in this world. Quest, conversations with you were about growth. Conversations with you were about, you know, you were very practical. You know, what is the next step for you? You know, and those conversations that I had got me thinking. And I remember that, you know, at some point, I at some point I found you weird, and I'll be very honest <laughs> because <laughs> you were nice. different from the people. And looking back and reflecting today, I understand you were very different from the world that I was in. You were very different from, you know, it was it was more of a doggy dog world, and you were more of a questioning, thinking, deep intuitive person and i was like no ben, i just want to make music videos you know and for me it was a growth process <laughs> yeah. but looking back now i've grown into being into a little bit more like you more reflective more questioning the whys yeah. as to just going ahead to do things i know you didn't yeah. i think you were one of those people in my journey that in some ways triggered me not just to fall into the crowd but to be yeah. different mm. yeah you you see listen you were special like it's it's as i can still remember it clearly i remember and this is the reason if if you go back everybody i felt was special i i made it a point to visit them in their house to take moments to speak to them because my my most influential artist is Tupac, right? And he mm -hmm. said, I might not be the change, but I I wish for sure trigger that change, trigger mm -hmm. that that fire, you know? And for me, this is this is if you respect because I never look things from gender, but society forces us to look things from a gender perspective. But I just feel like if you truly respect people, you will look at their mm -hmm. age, you will look at their mm -hmm. sex. You look at their potential, right? Mm -hmm. And even for all these years, we never, we never cross path. I always mm -hmm. just thought about, like, I hope she is pushing, you know? And boom, when I saw Casala, I was like, yes, 
you know. What once I saw Casala, I I maybe it's not a good thing, but when I saw Casala, I I stopped thinking about you. I don't know if this makes sense because it was like yeah, yes, like she is she is on the right path, you know. And it's amazing to see how you've. Because let's face it, the, the environment that you, you were in, it's like you said, dog eat dog, yeah. nobody yeah. really questions, nobody really yeah. sits down to reflect and say, no, yeah. this is not how things should go. But yeah. it's amazing. First of all, you're, you're a woman, you know, in an environment where maybe 90 something percent of the people are, are men and they're ego driven, they're mm. trying to be macho and all of this. And you're mm -hmm. learning through all of this, but still be able to keep your focus. Even it's hard for a man <laughs> to even survive in that environment. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. So, yeah. so my, my next question is, so you grew up within a clique, you know, because mm -hmm. that's how you survive. It's in Lagos mm -hmm. and all, it's clique, everybody's yeah. clique, clique. Yeah. How yeah. come, even when you were within that collective how come mm -hmm. you one of the things i never had to struggle with you never said oh this is my clique oh you always made it clear i am learning here mm -hmm. to go somewhere it's mm -hmm. something I, I have to give this to you you know you never made it look like no this is my home i'm going to sit here no mm -hmm. you always made it very clear that you were on a journey how mm -hmm. come um you didn't rest well, how come you didn't get settled there i think one of the reasons is because i had a very strong female role, role model my mom mm. and you know there's a time in our lives where she said to look at all of us and she said look even back then i didn't understand what she was doing but she said to us that look all of you here are your best friends she looked at all of us that we're big enough to form a football team make friends with yourselves so I grew up shielded with my sisters and I grew up shielded in that value of family, right? And I understood what truth was, you know? And, and my, mom, my mom was a very strong character. And I'll give you an instance. Um, my sister came up with a very high score in JAM and she wanted to study medicine in Ogun State University and the school refused to take her. So one morning, my mom says to me, oh, let's go, we're going somewhere. And she wants to go meet this Dr. Kuku, who is like one of these big medical doctors. And, you know, she just walks into this reception. And I'm with my mom. I had no clue what she wanted to do. She walked into his, this reception and, and dressed really nice and said, look, I'm here to see Dr. Kuku. And the, the, the secretary asked her, do you, do, you, do you have an appointment? And she said, no, I don't have an appointment, but I'm here to see him. And my mom waited. And they finally let her into this office. And I walk in with my mom. And next thing, my mom kneels down and she, she's begging this man that, look, this is my daughter's jam result. She's, you know, she's the best. You know, she got this high score. And the man was so shocked. And I was shocked. And, you know, she gave me this side eye and I knelt down with her. Like, you know, I was shocked. And the man said, madam, he got up from his seat and said, this woman, go dressed to the teeth. Please stand yeah. up. Please stand up. How can I help you? And he wrote this letter to her and said, take this to Ogun State University. Once I see this note, your daughter will get admitted. And that was how. And I'd seen this. And this is not the first instance. I'd, I've had this role model of strength, of pushing boundaries, of fighting, of family. So when I got into that environment, it's, I, I wasn't easily carried away. I knew exactly what my goals were. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew exactly the things that I felt would distract me. And I knew exactly, sort of like, the, and you know, it was me filtering out based on the strong female role model that I had. This woman expected the best from me. This woman would do anything. And I can't disappoint my family. I can't disappoint my mom. And that was sort of like the foundation that I had coming into this, into, into the industry then. So it was, it was, it was hard. It was really hard because when you sort of make compromises, you, it, it becomes easier for you. And when you don't, you're like at the bottom of the food shelf, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I had this strong role model and I had this strong background and I had the support system from my family and my sisters who were like my best friends. Yeah. 
and that was what really helped me. Yeah. We'll come, we'll come to your system because I know mm -hmm. how <laughs> how much of a support system they have. Um, yeah. But yeah. it's it's the same thing for me. I had the same type of mom, you know, like mm -hmm. very very laser focused. You know, mm -hmm. once she made mm -hmm. a decision, she mm -hmm. would she would have everybody say no, that's not possible. And twenty four hours later, she's made it happen. So I, I can mm -hmm. clearly understand. I can clearly understand that. Now let's look at this, right? <clears throat> also, when we met, one of the conversations I used to have then is how people need to stop um, stop making money the 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 center of every decision um, they made. And it, it then it used to be like, um, who are you? Like, how come you're changing? It was it was that was my transition now period of not chasing money, you know, because when mm -hmm. I came to Lagos, it was very clear the first few years I was on it. But then I just realized, oh no, I'm I'm losing my path. This is not why I came here. You know, mm -hmm. I came here to impact. I came here to so that when you look back eventually, you're not just looking at things you created, you're looking at impactful things you you yeah. gave to society. So I used to have this this conversation and one I remember this night um I would dropped you in, in, in Sue Larry and I think your sister was not around and we had a little conversation and you're like, yeah, I've realized that I'm not doing this for money. So that, that, mm -hmm. that's, that stuck with me. That was like, yeah, she gets it. Because like I said, mm -hmm. you were just fresh into this, this industry of making films, you know? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and that was an exciting thing to hear from you that you, yeah. you didn't need me to say so much about don't make money the focus, right? Now, mm -hmm. we go forward and we see a movie like Casaba, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Oops. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oops. I can pause it and you can take it. Yeah, yeah, it's off. fine. Okay, yes. That's good, yeah. Should I? Yes, please. Okay. So, uh, money, so, yes. Uh, it's yeah. funny that you're saying that because... At a point, for me, it went back to being making a living and surviving. Uh. Yes, it went there because, but, and you know, like, like I had to go back to my values. Yeah. And it came to the point where I felt that in order to exist in the industry, I had to take any, direct any kind of story, just earn a living, get accolades that, oh, yeah, she's the director of Skinny Girl in Transit. She does work for Ebony Life TV. She's one of the Nigerian Nollywood filmmakers. And yeah, she, even though it got to a point that I was earning in Nigeria standard a, a good amount of money, but I was drained physically, mentally, emotionally. And I think that that was one of the darkest periods in my life where it was so hard um, that you resume work at 7 a.m. in the morning, even earlier. And then you're coming back, you're driving in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., only to resume 7 a.m. the next day. Yeah. It was hard. It was lonely. It was, it was some of the darkest periods in, in my life. But I had to have a conversation with myself. And I said to myself that, look, Emma, you're creating works that at the end of the day would not last cannot stand the test of time and look at look look closely one young girl will come from america with an american accent yeah. and she's more glamorous and she next thing they'll say who are the women of nollywood because yeah. she fits a certain narrative they will pick her as opposed to you who, who you who you've been in the industry for ages you have to build your voice yeah. and you have to build your craft and at that moment the idea of Kasala came and now's where I made the film and now's where the whole success came and it was a very big lesson for me that look you have to choose are you going to are you going to to be 
a voiceless person or are you going to stand for something and create work that you'll be fulfilled and you crash and burn better now yeah um yeah so so it, it's it's amazing that you did because it's almost the same thing for me right coming to lagos i mm. i knew exactly what i wanted to do you know when i came in i was changing things at a fast pace but then i got into a system you know and the system was just moving so even if i had my original ideas and i was even using those ideas to guide things i was still within that system so i had to be like no this is not what I want to do, you know. Mm -hmm. What's the highest mm -hmm. point here? The highest point is managing maybe the biggest artists in Nigeria. What's that? What does that look like? It looks like that. That's not what I want to do, you know. What was mm -hmm. the highest point of mm -hmm. being a creative director in this mix? This is it. That's not what I want to do. I mm -hmm. want to do something way more impactful. So, mm -hmm. so it's amazing. But seeing Kasala, and I'm like, hmm, okay. So it does make sense now. There are, certain, there are certain experiences that I think if you have, they're important. Because mm -hmm. the fast pace that Kasala has, if you didn't put direct music videos and all of that and, and bring that, you know, because there is this, there's this very slow, slow pace um, frame that, that a lot of Nigerian movies they have and even if the storytelling is, is nice, it just becomes boring, you know? Mm -hmm. So Kasala's mm -hmm. not that. How did, you, how did you decide? Because you have so many stories. How did you decide that Kasala is going to be your first? Because, because Kasala is not a... I, 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 and I also know that you are saying, okay, money was not a thing. But I'm sure you had other, other stories that could be that could respond better to the Nigerian industry. Mm -hmm. So, so this is my question. Mm -hmm. How did you decide on Kasala? And how, and how did you know that Kasala was going to be more appreciated internationally? Mm -hmm. The funny thing was like, was about Kasala was the story came as a result of an anger in me. Oh. I wanted to tell, it was an anger like, I wanted to, I, I, I was I'm, I was done with women with Brazilian hair, American accent, living in Banana Island. I wanted to make something. And look, don't get me wrong. It's not Emma versus Nollywood. No, it's Emma versus theory. herself. That's, that's right. you, 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 yeah. It's, I'm not fighting Nollywood. Everybody, I believe everybody has a right to create whatever they want to create. But it was Emma versus herself, right? I wanted to make something that was mine, my voice. And for me, it was an experiment, an exploration of everything that I had learned coming together to create this film, um, using what I had available to create this film. And that was where the idea of Katala came. It, it, the idea of Katala actually came from my work as a documentary filmmaker. I was working with a journalist, a, with a Bloomberg journalist, and we went into Makoko to film. Mm. And we were interviewing this village chief and he pointed at his shack and he said, this is my mansion. They gave birth, they born me here. I go die for here. You know, go fit carrying me come up from here. And I felt that was extremely powerful. Yeah. Like, you know, and I, you know, the sad thing about people from this community is that they're either the slapstick gate men, the dummies in the films, the house girls. Yeah. But I, I could see the strength. I could see the community different, and I could see, yeah, very different. And I wanted to show this, the strength. And for me, Kasala is like my love letter to Lagos. Yeah. There's always something that will get you down. But at the end of the day, there's so many strong characters that rise up and is back to, to survive. It's a constant fight. And yeah. you rise up and you're building strength. And that was the, the idea for Kasala. So it was a gradual process for me, right? I, I had no clue what was going to happen to it. I'd borrowed money, raised money, threatened to kidnap my sister's son, 250K dropped. 
you know, <laughs> you know, and then I made this film. I just made it and I didn't know what was going to happen to it. So I was like, okay, based on my relationship, let me approach the people that I know. And all the doors just kept getting shot on my face. No, no, this is not for our target audience. This is not for us. And then somebody said to me, why don't you put it in a film festival? And I was like, film festivals? Like, I just felt like I didn't qualify. Like yeah. when you hear film festival, you think about, you know, Martin, Martin Scorsese's latest release or yeah. something. I didn't think that I could break into a film festival. So I was like, okay. I saw this film festival said, okay, send me your rough cut. We just want to see what we are working on. And that was where the magic started. They said they loved my film. They, when was I, how, you know, I had to finish it quickly to meet the festival. And it went to Paris. And that was where the magic just started happening. And for me, it was a revelation for me that my voice matters. I'm on the right path. Yeah. You know, there's always an audience for your work and they will find you. Yeah. It, it was a validation that, look, you don't have to compromise. And there's, there's, there, there's endless possibilities for you as a filmmaker. That was, that's the story of Katara. Yeah, and, and not, not to make people feel like this, this path this part that we've decided to take, it comes with mm. responsibilities, you know? Yeah. It, you yeah. also have to also embrace the fact that you might never be rich as that guy yes. or that lady or yes. whoever. You know, you, yeah. you also have to embrace that. You know, yeah. it is that we come to this realization where we are satisfied with the work that we produce. Yeah. If that yeah. is, the, if that is the effort, is that if this is where it ends, we are mm. satisfied with it mm. because mm. we know what uh, what matters. So, Casa, like, come back to representation. So, for me, the work that I'm doing now is really because I'm just looking back, back, and just looking at like everything comes back to how people are represented. You know, for me, it's about perspective. You know, mm. and that's mm. what I'm doing now, and that's what Casa is doing because Casa could have easily been a grass to grace story, you know? Mm. If any other director or some directors who, who direct movies in Nigeria, if they were to tell Kasala, it would have been a grass to grace, you know? And, mm. and the idea that it's part from the man, the chief saying, this is my mansion, you know? They bought me, I would die here. People are passionate about the yeah. ghetto. People yeah. love the ghetto, you know? Yeah. There are people who yeah. want to live together, that's fine. But yeah. the idea that the ghetto is the worst place ever. You know, mm -hmm. that's not the reality for a lot of people. You, you, you know, know, it's funny that you're saying that because when when the, the, the narrative that we've been fed and we've been, we, even we as Africans have taken is, oh, you know, there's a boy who builds the, the, the windmill and then he saves his village and everybody lives happily ever after. Or yeah. the detective who uses... Um, high fight gadget to fight to fight the criminal criminal that is not our reality our reality is that this this the society doesn't work yeah. but they are very strong dynamic characters within yeah. that society and their struggle enough is in is is, is powerful yeah. the man who pushes the wheelbarrow and gets one thousand naira gets one dollar a day to to feed his family he, he's a hero yeah. and the truth is that because a lot of young Nigerians do not see representations of themselves on screen that they are heroes too. That's why it's easy for them to be influenced. It, that's why there's a sense of hopelessness. And I think that for me as a filmmaker, it is my responsibility to show the average Nigerian, look, you're not the Oibo guy who has an AK-47 who fights the bad guy. Yeah. But the, the fact that you protect your family with a cutlass in the night to keep one million boys from your house yeah. is a is a story on its own and its strength on its own and it should be celebrated on screen and that's the way that my my life has evolved right now and you say yes we, we know that we not, we might not be rich but the sense of satisfaction that my yeah, work I, will I'm, leave, I'm talking about what people call material yes yeah. yes that for me is my wealth yeah. To see it, it's it's that value for me is is you can't quantify it. Can't, can't. That you go to bed every night and you are happy. You know that is my wealth. 
that yeah. I've been able to influence people, my wealth, that I've been able to let young filmmakers know that you don't, there's another way. It's my wealth to have people come to me to say, Emma, thank you, because what you created has given me hope to create my own, to be, yeah. to, you know, that is my wealth and a sense of peace, a sense of happiness for me that can never be quantified. Yeah, it, it's, it's beautiful. It's just, it's always for me, when I find, when I meet people from specifically now, it, it's, it's the same everywhere, but when I meet people from Nigeria who, who share this insight, not just people who share the insight, but who are making practical moves, you know, to, to bring their ideas into fusion. You know, because it's easy to say things, and when you go back home, you just relax, you know, and, and just go into what everybody is doing and everybody is saying. So now you, you, you are done with Kasala, right? You are going through all of this hustle. How does your family respond to that? In the beginning, they were very confused as to what I was doing with my life. And I'm coming from a family where we have three doctors. Um, <laughs> one works with the African Development Bank. She has a diplomatic passport. She flies everywhere in the world. Um, two people in consulting. So I came from that family and I want, my mom said, you want to be a cameraman. That's what she called me, cameraman. <laughs> you know. And at first, my parents were a bit confused, but over the years, they warmed up to it. And over the years, they could see the growth and they could see the passion that I had for this. And they, you know, they, they learned to trust me that. I think one of the major fears for family and parents is that would you be able to feed yourself? I hope you won't be a liability to all of us. And once they could see that, even though my father thinks I'm still an actress, and his friends still think I'm an actress <laughs> yeah. because they don't understand the concept of filmmaking. Yeah. Yeah. So as long as they see that I'm doing well, I can feed myself, I'm fine. Then they've come to terms with it, with what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so we, we constantly are burdened with um, the things that we need to do. Right. And mm -hmm. You, because once you have this clarity and you understand that, wow, we've not been properly informed or properly represented, and mm. this misrepresentation is affecting us here, and it's also mm. affecting how we see ourselves and how mm. we represent ourselves or each other. So do, do, you, do you sometimes let go of this body so that you can focus on the things you need to do, or do you carry this body along? Oh. Um, it's, it's, you can't let it go. It's like a, it's, I don't want to call it a monster. It's like that inner voice, that still voice that becomes louder and louder. Once you listen to it the first time and the second time and the third time, it becomes so loud that you can't let it go. So I, there's no way that I can get away from it. It's like my conscience is like, it's like me and it's my core. So I, 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 I can't, it, it, it constantly pushes me. In fact, it's pushed me to the point where I can't be, I can't accept less, to be less of who I am anymore. And with that question, I believe that there are two sets of people, the people that, and I, I feel like it goes in two ways. You, you ignore the voice that it becomes so tiny and it becomes, you can't hear it anymore. Yeah. Or you listen to that voice and you start, following that voice and it becomes so loud that it directs your every move and your every path. And I think I fall into that point where I've li constantly listened to the voice and constantly followed its nudging that it is so impossible for me to ignore. It's so loud that it's impossible for me to ignore. Yeah. So, so um, there's a question I'm coming to, but just mm -hmm. for the purpose of this conversation, how come you still want to live in Lagos? Oof. Lagos is a huge inspiration to me. It's, it's, it's a very dynamic city. You travel to Europe and everything is so organized. Like the, the, the way the flow, the movement, it's so organized and to me it feels very mechanical. Yeah. But with Lagos, 
it's it's like a burst of activity. I, I, and I, I do this in Lagos when I, I, I walk. That's the way that I clear my mind. I, I take long walks. And I walk through from, it's so amazing how the change can be so sudden. Yeah. You walk through Awolowa Road yeah. into a Balende, yeah. the broad hills at where those yeah. Okadas are parked. So the, the change is so Changing sudden. Changing fast. Fast. And then you walk into St. Gregory's and you're in another part of town or you go into Sabo and yeah. then you're in Iwaya, Sumakoko. It's the colors. Everything that passes around you is inspiration, is a story. And it, it, I love Lagos. It's like, it's like that burst of energy, that dynamic city that there's always something. There's always, you know, it's like man against... The failure of society, man versus society. Yeah. And yeah. every character, everybody is a unique, different, compelling story. Yeah. And that's why Lagos is that huge inspiration to me. Yeah. Lagos, Lagos is amazing. I, I always tell people they there'll never be a place like Lagos. It's it's yeah. It's, yeah. It's different. Like yeah. I carry it wherever I go and yeah. and it's it's just like so Emma, yeah. um, yeah. now you are done with Casala. You are moving mm. Casala from festival to festival, and mm. the conversation in Nigeria starts changing, right? Mm. So all mm. the people that close doors, they start hearing Casala, Casala, Casala. The conversation on Casala just kept on increasing and increasing and increasing, and Netflix comes and the first set of films to make Netflix, and all of this conversation, how do you even react to those people who were very adamant to even give you their ears, to now them just asking you, because I definitely know they're asking you already, so what's your next project, so what is this? Oh, how, how do uh, you I'm almost respond? like, you know, you know Nigeria now, where everybody is, Everybody's yeah. proud. Nobody will ask you what's your next work now. They want to see if you can recreate that magic again. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you're still like, so whatever, Katala, you know, they're still, it was a 4 million naira. We made a 40 million naira film. Yeah. You know, what does that have to, you know? But one thing I've learned is, and I've learned to be very humble about it, mm. because when you think about it, these people hold the gates to the Nigerian audience. Yeah. And it's you don't want to shut that gate out. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So I, the way that I approach it is, look, these guys run a business. And they probably must have taken a huge amount of loans to buy, to create the cinema houses. And their target is profit making. Yeah. And they hold the eyeballs to... Nigeria, which is you can't make a film about Nigeria. And one of the things that broke my heart is that I made Katala, and the people that I, the Nigerians that is meant for, yeah, didn't get to see it, maximize that viewing for the people that I made it for. So it's it's now me saying, look, I have to prove to these people that this model works. Yeah, I have to win their trust because you know, there's no getting around it. I have to win their trust to be able to say, and it, when you think about it from a business point of view, look, I, I don't think business regards gender or regards, um, you know, the, all that, gender and all of that. If you're able to make money for your clients, then you're valuable. So I need to be able to prove that I am a model or my model works. And well, if it means... Well, that's, this, is, this is the problem I'm saying. The mm. fact that you still need <laughs> proof. Because, yeah. because let's, let's face this, right? Let's face this. Mm. The movies that they're selling in Nigeria can't even go outside of the continent. You understand? Mm. Obviously, uh, Nigeria movies are big all over the continent, right? Mm. But mm. these movies can't even go into the the very critical festivals that would just tell you the truth right mm -hmm. and your move your movie has been moving 
you know, mm. has been mm. getting the attention of very serious panels and all of this. So I feel mm. like coming back home, they are supposed to be like, oh, shit, okay. So we are mm. waiting for your next project. The fact that but, but, but that opportunity is mm. not there. Mm. It, you're dealing with mindset. You're dealing with people that have made wedding party and has grossed, you know, this amount of money. So why should I bother about a film that just travels? What does that have to do with my pocket or paying the bill for my cinema? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's mindset. Um, unfortunately, in Nigeria, we are more about quantity and money as opposed to value and growth, right? Mm -hmm. So what I want to be able to do is Look, the thing, the, and the truth is, what I've learned is that I, I'm not, you know, okay, so Castella traveled and did all these wonderful things, and I come back on, and a lot of the industry players are like, oh, okay, whatever, and I've learned not to make it bother me. Yeah, it shouldn't. And what I say to myself is, you know, it's like, if this four million film can compete on this level, there's, this is just, and this is just the beginning. There's only greatness to come. And I would just face my work, yeah. focus on my work, create quality, and keep growing. And I'll be too good that they can't ignore. That is my motto. Do you see? Yeah. Yeah. That's so, the. That's the so that's I, the, I. Yeah. Mm. Sorry. You go. No, you go. Yeah. That's the, that's the Spike Lee, Eva DuVernay. Uh, yes. Yes. Motto, you know, because yeah, for for a long time, Spike Lee was seen as a crazy person, and now mm. when like Black American cinema, like it's impossible mm. if you remove his movies, it's just imagine mm. how crazy. Then you, you come back here and see Ava, you know, you know, just being behind the scene, making things happen, and. Mm the movies, the stories she decides to tell, even with mm. the power she has, because the power she has now, she can decide mm. to tell all that story. Mm. But the story mm. and, and, she's telling, yeah. Sorry to cut you, but I, I feel like this is very important for, for a lot of young people or a lot of people that are trying to break into an industry that, that I have ideas that make them stand out. Once you get into the place of hate, it affects your creativity. Yeah. Once it gets into the place of me against Nollywood, me against the cinema houses. It affects your creativity, it affects you, and it shuts a lot of doors on you, right? Because you tend to, you, you begin, you're beginning to be seen as a villain, you know? But once you face your work and you're as independent as possible and you're true to your own voice, then things spring up and people, people want to attach to that brand. I'm sure at some point Spike Lee was thought of as being crazy. Like, what the hell are you doing? Why don't you just make a coming to America, you know, yeah. and make people laugh, you yeah. know? Why don't you do this? But he stuck to it. And yeah. he kept being neutral as opposed to fighting, as opposed to, oh, you know, be very verbal and vocal. Just focus on your work, protect your creativity. Protect your mind space, protect your spirit, and so many things will come in. Yeah, that's that's the way that I approach it. Mm. So now, now I think this has this question has to come. So definitely, because of your journey and because mm. of how you've navigated so far, are you mm. planning to set up? Obviously, not now, not now. Anytime along your way, are you planning to set up? Um, a company a platform that helps young filmmakers achieve their goals Ooh, that's like a huge responsibility it, that's, well that's why I'm just saying it's just a question no 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 but the funny thing is that i've already in some ways i'm i've become like a local legend in nigeria <laughs> I'm serious. I like yeah, I have young well, people walk up to me and yeah, because for you to bypass the big oh, guns yeah. and you don't if people call me and say, Man, please, we need contact for Netflix. I'm like, I don't have contact. They saw the film and they collected it themselves. It's not like I have phone number to the head of Nigeria. I don't have so for me, for a country that is so dependent on on networks, 
for yeah. me to bypass that. I've become a sort of local legend in the con in, in the country. And it's it, it you know, I've fallen into that role of being a, an encourager of a director to young filmmakers because the first person they will run to is okay, Emma, I need to talk to you. I'm in this place and I feel like you you're that honest about your journey. Because unlike other filmmakers, they just started making films, you know, they got the big money. Nobody knew the growth process. So yeah. they become very distant to the young filmmakers. Yeah. So coming back to your question, it's a big responsibility. But I've somehow, I think life has somehow brought me or brought that responsibility to my table. And it's something that I can't avoid where I see the hurt in these people. I, I, I can em em emphasize with these people, empathize with these people and the journeys they're going through. And I see this young person, I remember my days in capital where I didn't even have enough money to take transport back home to get a bus back home. And I see and empathize with these people. And it's sort of like, I've become like a, you know, a person that I can't, if I, ha I, I, I do all I can to help or direct or to guide this is young filmmakers yeah yeah i i see i see i always say it's a decision you have to make whether you want to take that responsibility or not yeah. i i feel yeah. like personally if you move different it yeah. comes with the responsibility to help others who want to move different yeah whether yeah. you're setting a platform whether you're making yourself accessible whatever mm -hmm. you, however you decide to take that responsibility I feel it's a natural responsibility that comes with how we move and who we are, you know? Um, I mean, but I want to, yeah. In, can I say, in, in the film industry, there's always this something, this thing where, when, when you started, because equipment are now more cheaper. Yeah. Back then, you couldn't, before you touch a camera, you yeah. know, you have to watch the director's dress. You would, you know, you would run errands like crazy. You would drive the car, you wash it, you know? And because I've been through that journey and I not not necessarily that bad I had some fantastic mentors yeah you know but it was a lonely place for me and it was a lonely place for me as a female look Clarence was amazing but there's there's there, there's certain places where he could relate to me and to guide me maybe basically because of his background I had to learn the ropes myself I had to constantly keep making decisions and I'll give you an instance, right? It's so easy to, to, to get lost in the crowd, in the entertainment industry. It's so easy to get swallowed up or get swallowed up in this fame, in this wanting to be amongst the famous, and especially in the music video industry. And, you know, there's hardly anybody who back then who could talk to me to say, hey, Emma, this is the right path. I, you face this, face your work. These were conversations that I had to tell myself. And when I see young ladies in this space struggling, there's no, you know, it would be inhuman of me not to help. It would be, you know, it would be, very, it, I, it would be sheer wickedness not to, a young girl walks up to me to say, I'm facing this problem. How did you deal with when a man wants to sleep with you? And, yeah. and it's a very peculiar thing because yeah. you can't say no because all those shots yeah. from you, how do you maneuver? And, you know, you tell her, okay, look, you have to make yourself the best on the set, but make yourself also unavailable to these people. Yeah. How do you, these intricacies that I had to learn myself, yeah. it would be wicked of me not to help these young people and you know this responsibility is automatically thrown on your laps as a yeah. person yeah because because it's it's something that when i talk to um a lot of women now that i encountered back then when i was mm. deep into the music industry some mm. of like one conversation that we keep having is you were one of the person who never brought presented yeah. sex as this yeah. because it's it's yeah. it's something a lot of men hide from but it's a fact if you the entertainment yeah. industry is yeah women are already having it bad in yes society in nigeria the yeah entertainment industry is, is yeah. like, i can't even explain it like and, and you know the sad thing is like i kind of feel like the need to movement does not work in nigeria yeah. 
because our society is not ready for it in, yeah. in the sense that first things first our justice system is flawed Bad. very flawed so you your approach you have to approach this kind of things in a different way and from the point of being strong being look it's like your values have to be set from the get go that i even if i perish let me perish yeah. i would not do this you but know i would walk away thing. yeah because not everybody has that strength yes like, and yeah. you know yes and that's the thing not everybody has that strength and that ties back to it it's going to be very inhuman of me when i see somebody struggling and being vulnerable in that point how do you guide this person and help her remain relevant in this industry without compromising her values yeah um i just want to before i continue i just want to say if you ever are doing workshops or even just um private guidance or whatever and you need mm. different hands all always i'm always open to help you know if you need mm -hmm. me to just speak to anyone or because mm -hmm. this this is this is a continuous thing and mm -hmm. and it's not changing anytime soon you yeah. know um mm -hmm. but i just will also want to tell you that it's been amazing um just observing you um yeah mm -hmm. it's 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 amazing because looking back and now being where i am now and looking around there are not a lot of people in the position that we are in and yes. and you know exactly the position i'm talking about you yeah. know because mm -hmm. you can you can fly around the world and still come back without having a rich experience mm -hmm. and you can fly with first class and you still not have a rich experience and you can fly mm -hmm. with the lowest economy and you will gather the most experiences. Like when you come back, you'll be rich internally. Mm -hmm. And it's just mm -hmm. amazing to see you here, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, um, just remain focused, you know? I'm always here, don't forget. I'm always mm -hmm. here, you know? Because mm -hmm. is this, this is the battle that we're fighting. Now, mm -hmm. if there's anything you want to ask me, uh, I'm also, Open. Oh my God, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Why Ghana? <laughs> what happened to you? Yeah. You disappeared for a long time. Yeah. What happened to you? Why and why Ghana? You know, you just, you know, you like you just disappeared and then you reappeared, you yeah. know. Yeah. And yeah. I see these conversations. What is it? And I, what is the end point, right? It's easy for me to say, and you know, sometimes you can't really define for people like us what the end point is. It's, yeah. a, it's like evolving. Yeah. But for films, it's easy to say, okay, this is the direction she's going to. Yeah. What direction are you going with your conversations yeah. and with your life right now? So many questions. Yeah, so I will start with, I will start with white Ghana. You see, I stumbled on Ghana. So what happened with that? When I was transitioning, I stopped drinking in 2009. Okay. Right. I stopped drinking alcohol because I realized that to transition the way I had to, I have to stop drinking alcohol. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. when I stopped drinking alcohol, my circle just started reducing. Right. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I also knew that I had to um, recenter, refocus the energy that I have. You know, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and Lagos was not it. Mm -hmm. So the question was, okay, where should I go to? I, I wasn't going to go back to Benin to refocus. I wasn't going to go to any other state because I love Lagos, right? Then I, mm -hmm. I paid a visit to Ghana to do a project. Then I realized, oh, okay, this would be the best place to refocus, you know? So what I did in 2012, I brought, because I reduced who everybody I was managing, I was just managing one person. You know, then mm -hmm. I was still deep into managing creative directing and, and, and trying to produce um, from a musical perspective. So mm -hmm. I brought Billy and the Extreme Volumes here. Mm -hmm. And I brought them again the second year, that's 2013. And I was like, hmm, I would like to stay here and find the sound that we are chasing. Because Lagos brings distraction. So if you're trying mm -hmm. to um restructure and retune 
music or any any form of creativity you need time and i knew that i needed mm -hmm. two years to help the musician i was working with redefine the sound because musicians are always creative but i knew what i wanted i knew the direction i was going and i was the only one who had a vision of where we we're going to go to so i brought everybody here and we stayed two and a half years we were just doing live musical rehearsals like every three days three days in a week that's what we're doing you know mm -hmm. and for two and a half years and this is what i i had that time to go away because in lagos everybody would be like okay let's do this let's do this it was a yeah. lot and yeah. saying no every time to these people who counted on me was so to just disappear and go into nothing which was ghana mm -hmm. and just re refocus and re restructure it was then mm -hmm. i realized that oh um yeah music is good but music is not the tool i want to use mm -hmm. you know i i i am very very um concerned about representing and that's why sorry, I was, alarm. you said oh my alarm so i wanted you to use my alarm sorry okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm okay. very concerned about representation. And that's why I was making the music the way I was making it. But then mm -hmm. I realized that I want to be able to create at a very large scale, very flexible, not restricted to anything, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I was transitioning from the company, which is Blank Creation, which is music, entertainment. And I was transi transitioning into just telling stories. You know, okay. now mm -hmm. is the platform that I run, which is the, the art concept, which is a documenting and archiving platform. And the I goal is mm -hmm. to document and archive Africans and black people, just telling their story, just like we're doing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. yeah, but, but I have stayed in a crowd, not because of that. I found my partner here. And when I met my partner, it was just the easiest place to stay. But I'm always moving, so um, now I'm I'm moving again, you know. So oh, where are you moving to? I'm moving to London. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. going to be London, Accra, Lagos. It's it's going to be like that. But I feel like mm -hmm. this is me, you know. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to just travel because it's I want to travel a lot within the continent, and it's very expensive to fly from Lagos or Accra around the mm. country. It's very cheap to fly from Europe. So that's mm. where, so far, it's taking me to so think about it, transitioning from 20, 2008, you know, to now. So it's taking that, that time to restructure and change every single aspect that I wanted, needed to change to mm. be this, this person now, you know, mm. very, mm. very, very aware of, my image is surrounding yeah. so, so what what is the future you gather all these conversations what what do you want to do with this yes what do you see a, yourself doing with yeah, it it's, it's an archive you know okay. um, so now i we have there are different platforms you know but they are more like media platforms right okay so, but but this is an archive of documented conversations but well, these conversations mm. are not controlled by any person like for instance, you are telling your story, right? Mm. Um, this is not directed, this is not scripted or anything. And I'm having different types of conversations, right? But eventually, mm. it's not going to be just me having these conversations. Eventually, mm. I'm going to have people donating conversations, people donating documents. Mm, okay. So totally. it's, I'm documenting towards building an archive. But the archive is not just going to be digital. Mm. So the, the goal is to be able to have physical archives where mm -hmm. you can come to Lagos and walk into the archive and see thousands of conversations. So let's mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. right? And, and you know, it's, it's good that you're doing that. Sorry to cut you because um, we don't have, we have a history of covering up things. Yes. We, yes. There's no talk on Biafra. I can't, there's no archive for me to go back to hear yes. honest conversations about this. So we have a history of not speaking to um, burying things under the, the table. Yeah. So I think it's quite interesting. Yeah. We, we fear confrontation. That I just mm. feel like 
humans fear confrontation, right? So, mm -hmm. and when you look at historically where we're coming from, we're coming from a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. any point of trying to open that container, mm -hmm. a lot of people mm -hmm. are not ready to face you that know, fear. You know, and that's why I think Nigerians party the hardest. Yeah. Because there's a lot of buried yeah. issues. Yeah. Same, we same. party the hardest, we spend the hardest, yeah. we drink the hardest. Yeah. We, we party come, party when you come into Lagos, you feel that tension. Yeah, yeah. So 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 that's that's it. So the idea is is I want to end up um in a classroom, um, but completely I I want to so there's this there's this large larger conversation where where um, scholars you know academics are looking at who has who should tell a story, mm. right? Mm. Authenticate what knowledge production is, mm. right? So for for a long time, white people specifically white mm. men have told mm. our stories, you know. Mm. And it's, mm. On a large scale, control the telling of our story. The narrative, yes. Creatively or whatever. So, have you have you seen Queen Sono? No. Oh my goodness, you should watch it. Okay, I would definitely yeah. that. It's another narrative. Yeah. One. Yeah. Mm. So, so it is this. It's it's it's. I'm also in in the in, on the path of entering into that academia space and with all of these conversations and saying no representation matters identity matters storytelling mm. matters but who tells the story for who who are you telling the story for because for instance um a black person from any europe america asia could come to nigeria and tell kasala they'll tell it mm. different. a white mm. man or a white woman could come and tell kasala they'll tell it different so you mm. see perspective is different and who mm. you're telling the story for is different. If mm. you, Emma, you, if you're making Kasala and you wanted to tell Kasala for an international audience, to an international audience, it would be different. If you yeah. want to tell it to Nigerians who are based in Nigeria, it would be different. So yeah. all, of this, all of these nuances, you know, affect how stories are told. And mm. I am just in this, in this, in this journey of telling story from every perspective as possible so the goal mm. is to try and expand our narrative as much as possible through this documentation and maybe even one day um stereotypes will be reduced you know mm. So, mm. who knows mm. you know it's it it has no there's no end goal in because it, i feel like if you are archiving and documenting and you have an end goal then you already mm. are controlling the narrative you know? it, it's a much needed thing right now. It's a yeah. much needed conversation right now. Yeah. It's a much, especially in the digital age where the lines are being blurred. Yeah. Right. Content is like, like it's it's everywhere. Yeah. How do nobody, everybody just consumes and wants. Nobody wants to know know or pay attention to where it's coming from. Yeah. And this is the time where Africans have to be able to own their own aspect, own their conversations right now before it gets out of hand. One of, and I don't know what, I was very disappointed with um, the Black Panther because for me, it felt like a Western representation of what Africa should be. Do you understand? But, but, um, um, so, so this is what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? Who you are telling the story to, it matters, right? Because mm. for us, when we see you and myself, right, when we see black, uh, people, right, we're just like, nah, that's, that's mm. not us. But mm. if you look at the younger generation of Africans who are based here, who have been watching Iron Man and all of that, they're mm. excited to mm. see that Black Panther. If you mm. see black people abroad, they're excited because it brings them closer and closer. So the mm. audience also matters. It influences how you tell the story. This is the mm -hmm. reason why we have to tell our story, you know? And this mm -hmm. is the reason why it's mm -hmm. important to also remember that when telling this story and capturing this, this representation, it's, it's important to remember that 
also we are also at the audience we also want yeah. to know about ourselves so yeah. it's, it, it should be controlled by the audience with the most financial benefits you know we also mm -hmm. it's important to tell our story so that we know where we are coming from we know who mm -hmm. we are we know where we are going to mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Mm. great yeah so so i, I yeah i mean I, yeah this can go on for for yeah. a long time because i still have my don't worry but this can go on for a long time yeah. but you know i mm. i think i think we we are we are on the same path doing different things because mm. it comes down to representation it comes down yeah. to identity and and storytelling so yeah. emma Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank for you me. so much. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, um let's 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 keep let's keep communicating. Sure. Outside sure. of here because it lost. Sure. <laughs> sure. Right. sure. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.